So we don't want to think when we're, t- we're vaccinating our children, removing the- that innocence from them and thinking of future years, but we do want to pr- still protect them. Hello and welcome to another episode of the HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast. My name is Fergal Fox and today we're talking about vaccinations for your children. Now, as always, if you'd like to get in touch with us about the podcast, please send us an email at healthandwellbeing.communications at hse.ie. And that email address is in the podcast information wherever you're listening to this. And we all also ask you to please share this episode with a colleague, friend or somebody you would think would benefit. So today our guests are Dr. Lucy Jessup, who's the director of the National Immunization Office and a consultant in public health medicine. And we're also joined by Lorraine Hughes, who's here to talk to us as a parent representative. And that's who we really are hoping to reach to today with some important messages about vaccinations. You're very welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So we got a big reaction to our podcast back in early December last year about the COVID and flu vaccine. And it allowed us to address lots of things that people might be concerned about. So before we get stuck into vaccinations for children, can we just introduce vaccines again by explaining simply how they work? So that's one to you, Lucy. How do vaccines prevent disease? Sure. So vaccines are actually a very clever invention and they've been around for a couple of hundred years and they've obviously evolved over time. But essentially it teaches your immune system to recognise a particular disease. With just a tiny, uh, it might be a portion of the actual disease, it might be a weakened form of the disease that's in a a tiny amount uh, given through an injection or through a nasal spray or orally. Your immune system recognises that disease through the vaccine and then when you come in contact with the disease again, your immune system is primed and ready to fight that disease straight away. So the problem is when you come in contact with a disease, when you haven't been vaccinated, your body, your immune system takes a while to make a response. And that disease may overwhelm you and make you very sick or even kill you if you haven't had a, haven't been vaccinated. So your immune system hasn't been primed. So the vaccines prime your immune system. So the minute it finds it sees the disease, it meets the disease, it can fight it off. And you may not even know that you've been exposed to that disease at all because your immune system just neutralizes that disease straight away when you've been vaccinated. So that's why it's so important. We're primed our immune systems to help respond to these diseases that we don't know when we're going to meet them. We don't know when you might come in contact with someone who's carrying measles because some of these diseases you can be carrying them and you can be quite well or it can be before uh, the person maybe develops any symptoms. So it's so important to be vaccinated. Yeah, I remember the first I ever heard about vaccinations was when I was in national school. And I suppose, you know, as a parent now, I know, Lorraine, you're here as a parent, but as a parent, a lot of our like my children are all vaccinated. They got a couple of baby vaccines, you know, before just like as normal healthcare, like like when they're the most vulnerable, they're getting those vaccines. We kind of see it as a normal part of healthcare. Yes, we do. Absolutely. Yep. And it's it's very important. So the National Immunisation Advisory Committee, NIAC, they develop that schedule that we give babies. So we make sure that we give them when they're the most vulnerable. Like you say, babies are very small. Obviously, we know that. And we need to protect them when they're that most vulnerable. So they have five different visits as babies. So two for six months and 12 and 13 months. That completes your primary series of vaccinations, as we would call it. Very important that parents get those on time when their their children are most vulnerable to those disease. And then, uh, like you say, we would then go into schools and junior infants and give some more booster vaccines. And then again, in first year of secondary school. So very important that children complete that whole schedule. Yeah, so we'll come back to that schedule in a minute. But I suppose the point uh, I'm I'm thinking of, like it's like there's so many vaccines that we take as as normal as parents, isn't it, Lorraine, when we're in the hospital or, you know, they have the public health nurse coming out of us. Like we take on board the best advice, you know, when our babies are, are just so weak and, and vulnerable, don't we? Yeah, I think when we have a baby, our first response is to protect them. So we do it out of a natural want to protect them against anything or receive like getting any exposure to a disease Equally, we probably have received them ourselves as children. So our parents made that choice for us. So maybe there's a natural comfort from the, well, I've had this as a baby. So I feel comfortable giving this to my baby and giving them the protection that they need. But as we go through later stages of life, so in particular, say in the secondary schools vaccination program, HPV will be a newer of the vaccines that we may never have taken ourselves as a child. So you then come into this, well, now I need to make an informed decision. So 
how can I make sure that what I'm giving my child is going to protect them and equally anybody that they come exposed to, you know, in later life. So it then it's it's into the, the research. So it's making sure that you find the right information that you read up on it, whether it be the leaflet that's sent home from a school, what you find uh, online on, on rectal sources like the National Immunization have a website, immunization.ie. So that's, that's one of our key signposts for this, yeah. this episode, immunization.ie. And like you're saying there, Lorraine, a lot of our thinking around uh, vaccines, you know, we've been raised with vaccines, you know, like, and when we see new vaccines being introduced, we want to be comfortable and informed around that. And that's just your point, I suppose, to that signpost around immunization.ie. But tell us a bit about the HPV vaccine when that was introduced in 2010, uh, Lucy. Yes, the HPV vaccine was introduced in 2010 in Ireland for girls. And then more recently, we expanded it into boys in 2019. So it's now boys and girls in first year of second level that are that are given the vaccine. So I suppose particularly parents of boys, it is a, is a, is a bit of a new. And I know Lorraine is a parent of a boy. You know, it, it was something that you probably needed to look into and just make sure you were comfortable with. Yeah. And then seeing why you would give it to a boy. So it, it is understanding that it's not only protecting him, but it's actually protecting maybe future partners in particular, like women from cervical cancer. So it's it's like all of those vaccines. It's sometimes it's not in protecting yourself. It's actually those vulnerable around us. So that's kind of where I think it's important for mothers of uh, our parents of boys to consider vaccinating their sons to protect those around them that they will may con- come in contact with in future years. Yeah. So I think one of the pieces of research that, that you've done in relation to parents is, is that a bit of concern about why boys at, at first year. So it's all about their future sexual health and well-being, even though they're, they're you know, they may not be sexually active. That's It's not about that. Yeah, absolutely. So we know from uh, a lot of evidence that it's most effective given prior to sexual activity. So that's why we give it in, in, in uh, first year, so around 12, 13, so before they're sexually active. So it does protect very effectively against cervical cancer. There's now a lot of evidence because some countries even introduced it before Ireland in, in 2008. So we know it's very effective against cervical cancer, but we now know that HPV actually causes one in 20 cancers worldwide. So it doesn't just cause cervical cancer, it causes other cancers like penile cancers, anal cancers, and it is associated with head and neck cancers as well. Oh, so really? there's other other cancers we can prevent against uh, with the HPV vaccine. And that will be emerging evidence again over, over the next few years because uh, giving the vaccine to boys is a little bit newer in, in some countries. But so parents of boys, I think, uh, should be reassured and, and, and understand that we're protecting them, them directly against these cancers. We're also protecting against genital warts. And we are, uh, as Lorraine says, protecting their, their future uh, partners against cervical cancer. So the first HPV vaccine was for girls in 2010. And I think a lot of people will be familiar with the Laura Brennan campaign. And, and you know, so I suppose it is important to highlight that the boys piece is new, but it's, it's as you said there, it's, it's, it's covering a lot of things. It is exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I suppose HPV, uh, the way it's transmitted, it's really skin to skin contact. So right. that's mainly a sexual uh, contact, but it's not necessarily prevented with condoms, etc. So it is very important to also get the vaccine to make sure that our sons and daughters have maximal protection. So we're still communicating that in terms of, you know, telling parents about that relatively new vaccine for boys, but it's a what happens, you know, at a practical level, information is going to arrive home in school bags, isn't that it? Yep, that's right. Yep. So we're doing the first year programme in this term uh, now currently. So yes, yeah, school bag information should be coming very soon. So there'll be a leaflet with some explanation around the three vaccines that we give. So we give the HPV at the same time, we give a, a vaccine against meningitis and we give them another top up booster against tetanus. So there's three vaccines going into the boys and girls in first year in secondary school. So can you break those down for us in a bit of detail, please? We, we spoke about the HPV. We know what that, that is now. So what's what's next? Sure. Yep. So then we also give them protection against meningitis. So that's uh, what well, is it's meningococcal disease. So we call it the men ACWY. So there's four different types of the, the meningococcal disease that we are preventing against with that vaccine. And then also we give them a booster vaccine for tetanus, diphtheria and whooping cough. So they will have had in their baby jabs some of those uh, vaccines before, but we will be giving them a booster now. So we, so we give those all in first year of second level. And then that's really them completed in terms of their their national vaccine programs. That's very comprehensive. And what would you say to parents that are concerned about getting 
you know, those vaccines together. It's very safe. It's very effective. And obviously some people of, you know, adolescents can be a little bit nervous about vaccines. So I think giving them all together, it's it's one time to have those vaccines. So the nurses are very good at putting them at their ease, but at least they don't have to worry again for another visit. At least it's just the one visit that they get all their vaccines done at the same time. Uh, and then, yeah, so it's, it's more convenient for the, the adolescent themselves and, you know, hope, hoping to get a good coverage of those vaccines as we go through the, the term. At a practical level then, as well as the leaflet coming home, the school bag, it's public, local public health nurses coming into the school to do that? They're the, um, uh, from the, the community health organisation. So yes, they're the they're school school nurses and, and doctors that will come to do that. And so th- with the leaflet, there's a consent form. Yeah. So the parents must return the sign and return the consent form to the school so that the the, the, the teams can collect those forms and then provide the vaccines to the, the young people. And then obviously, as we've said, immunisation.ie has a lot more information for parents uh, around those vaccines if people want to look more into those vaccines before they sign the consent form. And then again, with with the form, there's a telephone number if people want to contact the, the, the local school teams to ask some other, other questions. You said that completes your immunization journey or your, your, your program. And, and that's the most recent that you've had, Lorraine. Your, your son just had that. Yes, just about because like that paper form that came home in the school bag, it was completed by me in first year, sent back in. And, and to my presumption, he'd handed it back into the school. But by the end of first year, I still hadn't got the phone call to say or the notice back that they were going to be vaccinating his year. And I did find it a little bit strange. So I followed up with the local area office and they said that they actually never received his form. So even though as a parent, I had received the form home by the school, filled it in, sent it back in somewhere. It got lost in the end of his school bag, the back of his locker or there with the mouldy sandwiches at the end of it. So they it just never came home and I never went back into the school. So I made then a new appointment for yeah, him. Well so, done. So they caught him with the catch up. So just yeah. to parents, though, I suppose it is to make sure that if you have sent it back in and you think maybe there's been quite a long time lapse and they're coming to the end of that first year to maybe just follow up with, you know, you can get the numbers on the immunization website as well. Just follow up to see where it is and they will facilitate you if for whatever reason that you've missed it or or maybe just that time wasn't right for you. You maybe didn't send in the form because you had just some reservations and you wanted to do a bit more research or wait another year just to figure things out yourself. They will facilitate that. So I, think, I suppose the, the message as well to be to it is is not too late if you miss that first year window. That sounds great, Lorraine. I suppose my own experience as a parent, you know, and we're all parents here around the table that when my daughter was going through that the HPV vaccination a couple of years ago, when it was still relatively new, that there was a bit of hesitancy in the, some of the parents and some of the girls. And I, th- I think the Laura Brennan campaign has done a massive job for us, but we need to kind of continue that job, don't we? Yes, absolutely. I suppose, as we've already said, I suppose uh, before the children are sexually active, maybe we don't necessarily want to think about the future, yeah. you know, uh, whereas Laura really brought that home to us. She was only 26 when, when very sadly she passed away from cervical cancer. So I think it really brought home how serious and how actually young people, young women with cervical cancer can be. And so I suppose that that really brought home to parents about the, the importance of the HPV vaccine. But you're right, we need to keep that, uh, get that awareness up in, in parents' mind. And as we've said already, the vaccine has been around in Ireland since 2010, in other countries since 2008. So we have a lot of available evidence now about the safety and effectiveness of that vaccine. So I think parents can be reassured it is not a new vaccine anymore. It's been a vaccine that we've we've had around for a long time and we're very reassured about the safety of that vaccine. I suppose as well, it's not to lose sight of the other vaccines that are administered at that same time of first year. So the tetanus and the meningococcal one, it's to make sure that we're also getting those for our children because that's the top of what they've had previously. So while, you know, HPV is probably quite topical at the moment, obviously by the Laura Brennan catch up campaigns, it is to remember that actually it's it's reinforcing that there's other vaccinations that we've given them previously. We're trying to top up so that they still remain vaccinated uh, against those other vaccine preventable diseases as well. Yeah, the the like you're, you're describing the the meningococcal there, the men A C W Y. You know that was a new term for me, and then I think of things like the MMR vaccination, and just rolls off the tongue that we just take it as normal in 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 some of the the earlier vaccinations. So maybe we talk back in terms of the vaccination journey. I heard a, a kind of an interesting way of looking at it, is that you have your baby vaccinations. So talking about vaccinations more broadly, 
What are the baby vaccinations, first of all, like, you know, that we get early doors? What, what would you categorise as that, Lucy? So we have a really comprehensive programme now in Ireland. So we do several vaccines at the two, four and six months of age. So they protect uh, the babies against a lot of things. We have something called the six in one. So that protects the babies against tetanus, diphtheria, polio, pertussis, which so that's whooping cough, Hib, which is uh, haemophilus influenza B, that, is, that also there's causes so many, meningitis. There's so many things there that we think we've, <laughs> we've eradicated from Irish society, or, or, from, from the world, really, that, you know, they sound like old diseases. I suppose it's because of vaccines, isn't it? Exactly. They, they sound old because we have high vaccine coverage, but unfortunately the coverage is slipping a little bit. Okay. So it is so important that parents still keep vaccinating because the diseases are so serious. And maybe we haven't seen children, uh, you know, as parents, with those things but our grandparents and our great grandparents would have definitely been very frightened about some of those diseases so polio for example a very frightening disease for for, for some parents and hib the haemophilus and another kind of meningitis it's very frightening for parents and prior to public health i was a pediatrician so i have seen some children with some of these diseases and it is it is something that we really must make sure that we protect our babies against to make sure that they don't come back and we need a large scale uptake for it to be effective we do exactly yes so it's it's to protect the baby absolutely yeah. direct protection for the baby but also with our communities making sure we have a high uptake it can we can really make sure that we protect so i interrupted you there you're up on the the 6 in 1 there when yep. you're describing i think i had missed hepatitis b as well so that's our that's our first 6 in the 6 in 1 and then we have pneumococcal disease that we protect against with another vaccine so that can give pneumonia it can also again give meningitis in young babies then meningitis b vaccine we would give meningitis c vaccine and uh, rotavirus vaccine so rotavirus is a disease that causes diarrhea and vomiting and prior to that vaccine that we introduced in 2016 we had a lot of cases of young babies coming into hospital with severe di- diarrhea and vomiting and those cases have plummeted since we oh, put that's the vaccine fantastic, in. yeah so they're the kind of the baby and and then when we go that's into the 246 that's and the then two, four, six, at uh, 12 and 13 months you will get top-ups of some of those vaccines okay. and then the new vaccine we put in there is then mmr so your measles mumps and rubella so you don't get that till you're 12 months of age but that would protect then uh, up until you get your next dose in in junior infants so the schools play a particular great role in this you just referenced junior infants so when you get into primary school what are you what are you looking at there in terms of the parents that have kids in primary schools that that vaccination ask or program what 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 things have been offered there then? Yep. So then you're getting your second dose of the measles, mumps, rubella, the MMR vaccine. Okay. And then you're also getting your next booster of your tetanus, diphtheria, the whooping cough and the polio. So it's, you can put them in three different buckets, I guess. There's those baby vaccinations that you just went through, the primary school ones, and then the, the post-primary to top it off is that first year or second year, if you if you missed the first year, the uh, vaccination program that you just you, you spoke about earlier with the effectively a three in one as well. Uh, well, they're three different vaccines, oh, uh, but they they are given at the same time exactly to okay. to make it as sort of convenient as possible for everybody that we're we're giving them just in that one visit. But uh, and then that does complete, like we said, your your national vaccine program. But then we do obviously, as you know, offer other vaccines, so our COVID vaccine program, flu vaccine for those vulnerable pregnant women, etc. So there are other vaccines offered throughout the life course. Now we really expanding the, the philosophy of vaccines, not just to babies and young children, but it's actually across the life course. So across life, there'll be lots of other vaccines that you may be offered depending on various medical conditions, etc. Is there any particular groups we need to target in terms of their vaccination rates at the moment? Well, particularly, I, I think we are a, a little bit concerned about those baby vaccines and some of the vaccines in school with COVID. I suppose people were maybe not going out to the GP as much they maybe weren't socializing as much as they were and we need to now so so our rates did drop a bit and we really need to to remind parents again it's so important to get those vaccines and to get them on time I think maybe some parents maybe delay a little bit uh, with the vaccines but it's so important to make sure that we get them on time because that's when your child is so vulnerable and particularly the MMR vaccine so the measles component we know there's a lot of measles circulating in England and some other countries in Europe as well so measles is very serious for young babies so so important to get that dose in at, at 12 months of age in fact my son I remember his birthday was on a Sunday his first birthday otherwise he would have got his MMR on that day I had to wait till the Monday so he was one year and one day old but I I was absolutely adamant I had to get it on time because it's so important measles is such a serious disease yeah do you think the parents have lost sight of those uh, uh, Lorraine when we we don't like we think we've eradicated some of these diseases are there they're way back in the rearview mirror. And I think that's what maybe some of it is, is that we actually don't even consider these yeah. um, a, as being diseases anymore because they were probably never really in our lifetime. As Lucy kind of touched on, if we spoke to grandparents about the likes of, you know, polio and other diseases that were out in their lifetime, they were like wildly scared of it. They 
got their children vaccinated then when vaccines were available. Our parents got us vaccinated. And maybe we just slipped because it's not there. We don't think about it anymore. But with news reports that you're seeing with rises in the UK of the measles, I read also about whooping cough. Again, things that I thought were gone. But they're coming back because maybe, you know, even probably during the pandemic, we did miss appointments that we wouldn't naturally have normally met or missed. And now it's trying to get back up there, get our children vaccinated, you know, make sure that we're protecting not only the vulnerable in our society, but the pregnant women. Just as you're talking there, Lorraine, I want to go into some of the research that you've researched insights around what parents have told you guys in terms of what they think at the moment or what they're learning and what they need to learn. One of the issues that's come up in in terms of parents and the HPV vaccines for boys, that it was making parents uncomfortable in terms of that sexual contact or or they didn't appreciate what the risk factors were. Is that something that, that we're doing a lot of work on now? So, yeah, as a part of our our materials that we have, we do try and explain to parents exactly the importance of the HPV vaccine, how it's transmitted, uh, like I said, with skin to skin contact, etc. So, yeah, Gen- talking about genital warts is not, not a, it's going to make everybody uncomfortable, but <laughs> in terms of parents thinking about their little boys and little girls. So, we don't want to think when we're thinking about vaccinating our children, removing the, that innocence from them and thinking of future years, but we do want to still protect them. They're at the, also the age where we probably need to consult them a little little bit in that decision making process. So when they were babies or in junior infants, we as a parent made our best decision for them to protect them. But now they're of the age where they can understand a little bit more. They're also going into a, you know, school in secondary and receiving that vaccine without you there maybe beside them. So making sure that they understand it too and you have that conversation so that they feel part of I'm part of this decision. I'm the one that's also saying yes to receiving this vaccine. And I felt that in particular with my my son. And one thing that I particularly appreciated was how the vaccinator spoke to him versus me. They spoke to him about, did they understand the vaccines he was about to receive that day, what he knew about them and why he thought he was getting them. And they very much focused their conversation to him. And then that was just that last little check in before the vaccine was administered of the, is everything okay with that, ma'am? And that I felt was brilliant because it meant he knew he had full rights over what was going into his arm and he was part of that decision rather than I just decided without his consultation. Yeah. I suppose we have to acknowledge here that it is challenging for a parent there to get this information. It, you know, there's a lot of information coming in in that leaflet that's coming in the school bag. That's why we were repeatedly pointing you back to that immunization.e. There's more information there and there's some video content and blog content to give you more insights. But as you said, Lorraine, there, we're trying to empower the parents and we're trying to empower the young people in terms of knowing as much as possible, you know, and, and I suppose we should talk about the evidence now, you know, that, um, you know, you, you said there earlier on, Lucy, about the 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 night you mentioned NIAC. Can you tell us a bit more about that? You know, what, what process we have around, you know, the safety and effectiveness of these vaccines? In terms of the, the NIAC itself, so that's the National Immunisation Advisory Committee. So that's an independent group of experts that would look at vaccines that are available in in Ireland. They would look at across the world. They would look, like you say, at the evidence. They would also look at the disease rates in Ireland to see which are the most important vaccines that we should have in our programmes. And so they that's why the, the programme is updated on a regular basis to make sure that we are uh, looking at the evidence and, and constantly uh, making sure we're giving the best protection to the children in Ireland. And then the Department of Health would then be sent those recommendations and then they would... Um, make a decision on introducing those vaccines into the country. So that's that's really the process that's gone through, but it is a very rigorous process around the evidence and what's most important in Ireland. And then we also have the... Um, the, the I, th- Euro- I think that's very reassuring and important for parents to hear. Yeah. And then we have the European Medicines Agency and the uh, Health Products Reg- Regulatory Agency in Ireland, HPRA, that would then look at the safety of the vaccines and uh, as well. So we're, they, we're constantly monitoring the safety of the vaccines. Parents themselves or patients, doctors, etc., can uh, notify any potential side effects of those vaccines and they would be collecting that evidence. So we're we're very reassured about the safety of the vaccines that we have in Ireland. The, mo- the most side effects that people might find usually maybe would be like a sore arm, possibly a slight fever. Other than that, the, the side effects are very rare. Okay. One of the things the parents highlighted in the research as well around needing reminders, you know, and, and I suppose we're all like parents are really busy. There's loads of like whether you're whether you're working or you're not working, if you have a family, you're you've always a very busy to do list. How do we do that reminders to keep parents in the loop on what's due? 
So there's various ways, I suppose, that the GP can send reminders, as does the, the local area would send reminders for the baby vaccines. And then for the uh, junior infants and the uh, the first year vaccines, it's, it's media like this, making sure that we're, we're getting out to parents. We would also put out press releases to try and uh, ensure parents are aware and, and putting out uh, reminders through the schools as well, as uh, as we've talked about, making sure we remind them to, to look in that school bag and see behind the mouldy sandwiches, is there, <laughs> is there yeah. a consent form that they need to, yeah. to fill in? Because children are not well known of giving parents forms on time necessarily. No, and in particular. <laughs> Particular, particular boys, they're not very organised, so we might go in with the best intention, but it might not come out the other side. But it's also then for the parents, like in my own experience, where I had sent in the consent form and I knew too much time had elapsed. It, it is then just checking in with your local area office, maybe your GP, you might happen to be in there just a- asking them, when do you think this should happen? And, and just as well, we get the baby passports when, when they're little. So it is just making sure that you follow up on that. I remember myself getting, I think it was a fridge magnet that was kind of telling me all the little monthly milestones of when I, when my son needed to go in and get the next vaccine. So again, life is very busy, but there is a lot of touch points that we can do uh, and we can always lean in on, on the, you know, your, your GP or a local public health nurse that will be able to even guide you of where to go. So Lorraine, you mentioned the, the fridge magnet there. I've seen those fridge magnets, you know, highlighting the vaccine journey. I think that's a great little resource to have on your fridge just to keep in mind, you know, what's coming up. And I suppose, it, you know, it is a vaccine journey. And, and Lucy, you mentioned there that there's, you know, vaccines are going to be a part of everybody's lives in the future. It's important for healthcare. It's important for our health. And, and one of the things we didn't mention is the vaccine for pregnant women. Yeah, so there are several several vaccines that we offer pregnant women as well. And uh, one of them is the whooping cough vaccine, so the pertussis vaccine. So that's recommended for women, something that you can get from your GP. So, so it's protecting the baby as early as possible. Oh, yes. Yeah, so so basically, as the mother, you make that response. You make yeah. these things called antibodies and they would pass through the placenta to the baby. And then when the baby is born, the baby is protected against whooping cough until they come become two months old and they're able to get the vaccine themselves. So it's protecting that baby in that small window between when they're born and when they uh, can get their first vaccine, just to make sure because very small babies are very vulnerable against pertussis. And it's very serious uh, if a very small baby gets pertussis. I've, I've seen it myself, unfortunately, with it, working in hospitals. And it is very frightening for parents when their babies are really bad basically kind of stopping breathing for a, a time going blue you know it's it's very very frightening so we really don't want that for our young babies so that's why we offer the pertussis vaccine in pregnancy we do also during the flu season offer the flu vaccine in pregnancy that's been around for quite a long time and then now more recently obviously the covid vaccine as well so pregnant women are advised to get a dose of covid vaccine in pregnancy so that would protect themselves as a pregnant woman you are a little bit immunocompromised so that protects you against serious illness and then it would also again those protection would pass across the placenta to the baby in protect them when they're very young. So another group, I guess, that we're talking to, like we're talking to a lot of parents, or we hope that a lot of parents be listening to this podcast, but a lot of our HSE staff are are parents as well, but a lot of people be working in healthcare that may be listening to this podcast. Is there any particular message to the people working in healthcare around vaccinations that we want to want them to tune into? Yeah, so I think you're, you're absolutely right. So they're, they're, they're parents, their grandparents, maybe aunties, uncles, godparents, etc. So any touch point you have with a parent, I think it's important to, to remind them, oh, have you so-and-so vaccinated? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe they're of the right age, etc. But I think it's important to remember that what we know from all of our, our, our studies is that healthcare professionals are the most trusted source of information for parents. So very important as a healthcare professional to uh, be up to date and understand about vaccines and to just start that conversation with parents around vaccines and the importance of vaccines and we do have a lot of material now on HSE land HSE land for HSC staff is a really great resource we even have an e-learning program about how to talk to parents who may be a little bit hesitant about vaccines so we have that resource there we have an awful lot of other information for healthcare workers that they can get up-to-date information about vaccines so they can answer those questions but yeah they are a really trusted source of of, of information so so very important to be up to date okay so like as, as we're wrapping up this podcast it all comes down to parental confidence, you know, whether it be in the healthcare professional or the information. And we're, we're repeatedly signposting to immunization.e, but, it, but we can all play a part in that parental confidence, can't we, Lucy? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's so important that parents are, are fully informed about vaccines and we do try and make sure we have that information available to them in lots of different forms and lots of different sources. We've talked about the website, we've talked to, about parental information from healthcare professionals. So any healthcare professional you come in contact with, they should be uh, informed, particularly your GPs, as uh, we've mentioned, your public health nurses for babies, they come and visit quite frequently. So do ask them questions, do make sure that you have, are fully up to date with that information. But do also be careful when you're looking online 
online because we know there's a lot of information out there that may not be completely accurate. So do look at the source of information, make sure that it's definitely from a reputable source. And we would say immunization.ie in Ireland, also the, the World Health Organization is another very trusted source of information. So do make sure when you're looking at information online that just checking the, the, the accuracy of that uh, that resource that you're looking at. Okay, well, Lucas, I really appreciate you coming in to speak to me today. Lorraine, thank you for your insights. And Lucy, it is complex. I guess there's a lot of different uh, vaccinations, but I think you give a good job of giving an overview there. We gave the signpost of immunization.e. So I'd like to thank you for coming in today. And I'd like to thank you, the listener, for tuning in to another episode of the HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast. <laughs>